Have you ever bought a genuine lubricant from the likes of John Deere, Toyota, Mercedes-Benz, Hitachi, and ever wondered, do they actually make this stuff? Well, it's the industry's worst kept secret that no, most of these brands are not actually manufacturing. They are, after all, not oil companies themselves. And in fact, generally they go to a large oil company who manufactures on their behalf and then simply white labels the product. But if you've ever wanted to know how exactly can I figure out who is making it and what are the steps that they go through in terms of specifications and who's really kind of setting the tone for these products, well, that's what we'll explore in this video. Now, it should be said from the outset that there is no simple one-to-one -one relationship when describing who is manufacturing these products. It's impossible to say, for example, that Volvo is manufactured simply by Shell. And it's because sometimes these manufacturing contracts are awarded by region. So Volvo, for example, who have both a passenger vehicle and a commercial vehicle division, might bid those separately. They might go out to tender in different parts of the world and different manufacturers might win the tender in different parts of the world. In some cases, it might be a global tender. And in fact, there is a single organization that is manufacturing the OEM fluid across the world. In other cases, who manufactures the oils versus who manufactures the grease can be different. So if you'll remember during that weird COVID period when we were experiencing a lot of supply chain challenges, there was a facility that was owned by Chemtool, that's a Lubrizol company in Rockton, Illinois. And that unfortunately burnt to the ground. Fortunately, no loss of life. And that was actually a major grease manufacturer for many of the OEMs. So they made, for example, the John Deere grease. Um, but they didn't make any lubricants. So the oils for those different companies were clearly made by someone else. Now, the easiest trick in the book, if you want to discover who actually manufactures these lubricants, is mostly to go to the safety data sheet because the safety data sheet generally lists the actual manufacturer. So here's an example. I'm gonna search for Volvo engine oil VDS 15W40. And that's gonna take me to a safety data sheet. And if I go across, First of all, you can see the print date on this is 2021. So relatively recent, and you can probably be safe to assume that the manufacturer hasn't changed in the intervening three years. And sure enough, under manufacturer or suppliers detail, Shell Oil Products US. That's a pretty good indication that Shell is making the Volvo oil. Similarly, we can do the same search for Caterpillar diesel engine oil. Maybe it's the ultra low sulfur version, 15W40. Again, you can look up the SDS and sure enough, under company identification, we have ExxonMobil Corporation. The reason these are often listed is because in this case, what they wanna say is if there are any safety issues, who should you be contacting? Well, it's the manufacturer of record. How about Toyota Genuine Motor Oil, a 0W30? Well, in this case, this is a sort of like an interesting one, right? This is clearly an old data sheet because it shows the manufacturer to be Caltex Australia Petroleum Limited. Now, that's a company that doesn't actually exist anymore. They've morphed into a company that's now known as Ampol, right? So it's a, an Australian company that used to own the rights to the Caltex name, but actually sells mobile product now. Now, what's interesting about this is they might still make the Toyota Genuine product, but Ampol as a lubricants manufacturer doesn't exist outside of Australia. And so what this tells us is that the Toyota Genuine Oil is almost definitely manufactured by someone else in, let's say, for example, the US or South America. It will be sort of a regionally defined contract. But this still gives us an idea of who is likely to be manufacturing it. Now, remember, these contracts change. And generally, what will happen there is that the formulation won't. And this brings us on to the second topic, which is who exactly is kind of in control here? Is it the oil companies that are manufacturing and are specifying the product? Or is it coming from the manufacturers? So what we would generally say is it's likely that the OEM is the one that's setting the specifications. After all, in the passenger vehicle world, there are any number of specifications that exceed, for example, the API specs. In commercial vehicles, for example, you have the API CK4, and then all the other truck manufacturers will have their own specifications that sit on top of that. If you're a European manufacturer, most likely it's based on an ASEA claim, and then there's an additional requirement on top of that. So then, then take those specifications, go to the oil manufacturer and say, I want you to make something with these performance properties, go ahead and, and make something. Or alternatively, the OEM might work directly with some of the lubricant additive companies to come up with a formulation, they then own the IP to that formulation and then farm it out to a toll blender. And this is pretty common practice within the industry. You actually see it, for example, in commercial vehicle off-highway. So let's say, for example, if you took the Caterpillar specifications for hydraulic oil, one thing that you'll find is that they have this unique quirk 
where they define the amount of zinc that needs to be in the hydraulic oil formulation. And this is a little bugbear of mine, but Caterpillar always define 900 parts per million of zinc at the very least. Now, viewers of this channel, because we've gone through this before, will know that the Z in ZDDP, or the Z in ZDDP, if you're American, doesn't actually do anything, right? It's the P, it's the phosphorus that does all the work, and yet they're defining it on a zinc specification. That's the first reason why it's annoying. The second reason why it's annoying is because there are alternative anti-wear chemistries. Why do we have to use zinc in order to get the performance that's required? In fact, in some mobile hydraulic applications, we know that zinc often leads to sludging because of thermal degradation of the actual zinc molecule. And if you don't believe me, talk to anyone on a mine site who happens to have Hitachi excavation equipment. You'll know it's a problem. Now, speaking of Hitachi, their engine oil actually appears to be manufactured by Total, which is kind of interesting. That was maybe a little bit unexpected. And while we're here, we might as well knock over a few others. So we've got Case, for example, their engine oil super is manufactured by Shell, at least in the Middle East. I'm not sure about the US. John Deere's hydraulic oils, at least are made by Philip 66. And then AC Delco, which is GM's product, is mostly made by ExxonMobil. Although I did find one instance of it being manufactured by Chevron in the Middle East. Finally, BMW, their genuine oil appears to be made by Fuchs. It should be noted that you can't always go to the SDS for this kind of information. Daimler Trucks, for example, lists all of the SDSs on their website, and if you go into any of them, they simply list Daimler as the manufacturer of record. So that doesn't really tell us exactly who manufactures the product. It's pretty unlikely that it's Daimler that's actually doing the blending there. But for a lot of companies, we can go to the SDS to find out. So what's the ultimate answer on who makes these products? Unfortunately, it depends, because it depends on location and it depends on time. And this is because it's a contractual relationship between the OEM and the oil company that makes the product. Sometimes that contract ends, a new person wins it. 